Hey, what's up guys? I know you might have already seen that this video is a lot longer when you clicked on it and this is because it's a very special video. In this video guide, I will teach you pretty much everything I learned in the last couple of years when it comes to buying gear and choosing the right sniper system and in general, I guide you through when you want to get an airsoft sniper, what do you have to take care of because I made a lot of mistakes, I spent a lot of money on useless stuff and I don't want you to make the same mistakes again. So I put together this Norwich Academy. Now the Norwich Academy is also on Norwich.com if you want it a little more organized because again this is a two hour long video and it's kind of hard to navigate through it. So visit Norwich.com if you want to watch the Academy again after watching this video. And also the Academy on Norwich.com will always get updated, there will always be new videos, new content so make sure to check it out regularly for new cool videos. So without any further ado, let's get into the Norwich Academy. So you want to be a sniper, well you found the right spot. Here in the Norwich Academy I will guide you through all steps you need to know how to start as an airsoft sniper. I will guide you through which gear is the most useful, which guns are the most accurate, how do you maintain your gun. All this kind of stuff you will learn it right here. Now if you've never played airsoft in your entire life and you want to get into the sport, let me tell you this. Don't start with an airsoft sniper, it's, it's really hard, it might be really disappointing because your enemies with the AGs, with the automatic guns, they might outperform you. So lots of people who get into the sport by airsoft sniping, they quit. So I would rather go with a budget AEG to get into the sport so you can kind of see if you like the sport and also you will get better results in the beginning. Anyways, I know that lots of you guys, you just want to start airsoft sniping and no matter how hard I try to stop you from this, you will still do it because you're very passionate about it and I totally understand. I mean, just the, the idea of, you know, having a sniper and a scope, you have the enemy in the crosshair, you pull the trigger, you see that BB flying in your scope and you hit your target at really long range. It's just amazing. And if you're one of those people and I can't stop you from starting as an airsoft sniper, please make sure to watch this entire guide, this entire Norwich Academy, so you don't make the most common mistakes of buying shitty sniper rifles and stuff like this. Yeah, so much for this, let's... Wait, 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 before we get started, let me introduce myself. I'm Norwich, I'm running a YouTube channel called Norwich, obviously, and it's all about airsoft sniping. Now, I'm doing airsoft sniping since 8 years already, I also had an uh, education at the military for sharpshooting, and I just, I just did airsoft sniping, so I collected all this knowledge over the last few years and I did make a lot of mistakes when it comes to buying sniper rifles, buying upgrade parts and I did learn a lot by trail and error and I did spend a lot of money on things that didn't work. So that's why I made this guide, because I don't want you guys to make the same mistakes. Second video of this academy, if you've already come this far you decided to become an airsoft sniper. Congratulations, you will get to the point where you will really enjoy the experience. But let me tell you the following. In the beginning, it will be hard. There will be lots of disappointments. It's getting an airsoft sniper, an efficient airsoft sniper, it's a long way. But once you will be there, you will, you will love it. It's amazing. Let me guide you through the different systems you can choose when you start airsoft sniping. You can either go with a semi-automatic sniper rifle or a bolt action powered one. Now the disadvantage of the semi-automatic sniper rifle is that every field limits them on FPS. So if you want to make really long range shots and you want to outrange everybody on the field, the only way to go is the bolt action sniper rifle. If you're having problems to decide if you either want to go the aggressive assaulter route or the sneaky sniper route, I recommend looking into semi-automatic sniper rifle because it's kind of a mix. But if you want to be the sniper that takes those insanely long range shots from far away and nobody knows where it's coming from, I would go with the bolt action sniper rifle. Here we have three different systems. First we have the gas operated one. They are either operated with green gas or CO2. I don't recommend those rifles at all, they're very inconsistent, they, they're just not reliable. I wouldn't go with them to be honest. Um, they do provide some realism because the bolt opens but if you want to be efficient and you want to take those long range shots, don't, don't go with them. They're just, they're not very practical. The second available system is HBA. 
It's basically an air pressure system which supplies your bolt with high air pressure. Now there you have the problem that you have either a tank on the back with a hose into your bolt, so you kind of connect your gear to your sniper rifle which, which sucks in a lot of situations, or you have CO2 cartridges in your stock but then you run out of the gas very quickly and also those systems they are kind of complex, they, some of them are solved mechanically, those are not very consistent and they're the ones which are controlled by electronic but there you have a battery you have so many components and the more components you have the more can go wrong so i'm i'm not a big fan of those systems i don't really see that one the last option is in my opinion by far the best option it's spring powered why is it the best option it's reliable it's consistent it always works no matter which temperature it's just it's by far the best one even though there's one disadvantage, you have to compress the spring yourself with your muscles. Here inside of an M180, which already produces way higher energy than most fields allow, but still I can compress it with my pinky without any issues. So why spring power the best option? It works no matter which temperature. It works forever. Once you have a good system, it will work for many, many years. It will never let you down. It's very consistent because basically it's just a piston moving inside the cylinder. There are no variables, there's no electronics. It just works. And because it's so simple, it never fails. So that's what I would recommend to everybody who starts airsoft sniping. And when you look out there on all those YouTube channels who do airsoft sniping, all of them use a spring power system. Which sniper rifle should I buy? Now that's a question I'm getting a lot. And the reason for this is because it's the most important question when you start as the airsoft sniper. Your sniper rifle is your most important tool when it comes to sniping right after your safety. Your safety protection is obviously priority number one, but right afterwards is your sniper rifle. If this piece of equipment is not effective, you won't be effective on the field and you probably won't have any fun. So let me talk about this a little more detailed on which ways to go, how you can get a very efficient, nice performing sniper rifle. Option number one is buying a very cheap China made sniper rifle and I promise you, you won't have any fun, you will go to the field, the gun will suck, you won't hit anybody and you will probably quit as of sniping. So that's the option I'm recommending the least, just don't do it. Option number two is going with a decent upgrade base, now there are lots of options out there, there's the VSA 10 system, APS2 system, I will talk about this in a little more detail later but let me say this. Upgrading a sniper rifle from stock to a nice performance, it's really difficult and you should have some tech knowledge. Already the terms I used, VS10, APS2, maybe you're not familiar with them. If you're not, I don't really recommend upgrading a sniper rifle. It is kind of difficult to be honest. Here I have a Tokimaru VS10, it's the platform where there are the most tuning parts out there. You can completely customize the gun on the externals and also on the internals. But again, it is quite difficult. When it comes to upgrading sniper rifles, you also have to understand that even if you exchange all internals, like I did it on this gun, there will always be some issues because the base gun just wasn't a very high quality gun. Even if this gun is a Toki Marui, it still feels kinda toyish. When you look at the stock, for example, it's a very thin metal. If I fall onto this gun with my whole body weight, I will probably crack the stock right here. Then also the outer barrel, I removed already the end cap so you can see how thin the outer barrel is, it's a thin aluminium tube. So even if you exchange all internals and you make it shoot good, it's still not the perfect sniper rifle because it's of very weak materials. And once you also start exchanging the externals like the receiver and the barrel, it will get really expensive and you will end somewhere above 1000 US dollars. Option number three, which is in my opinion the best option, is going with a sniper rifle, which is already decent out of the box. Now it's very rare to find something like this on the airsoft market and that's the reason why I developed my own sniper, it's the Norwich SSG24 and it is in my opinion one of the best, if not the best, performing sniper rifle out of the box on the market right now. Why is it like this? Um, it can take whatever spring you can pull basically, it has a precision barrel, it's very accurate, powerful, reliable. It's just a perfect gun in my opinion. And 
You know, I'm doing airsoft sniping since 8 years now. I upgraded around 200 sniper rifles from all kinds of different brands. I tried lots of things, different precision barrels and stuff. So I really know what's important to get a gun, a bolt action sniper rifle, to get it accurate, reliable and powerful. So all this knowledge went into this gun to make it as perfect as it is. The reason why I mentioned that I think this is the best option to go is because you don't have the whole hassle of upgrading a sniper rifle. If you've never done it, I'm telling you it's hard, it's really hard. You have to worry about, you know, what's the best upgrade base, which tuning parts are compatible with which brand, then maybe something breaks, you have to look for spare parts, you upgrade the piston, then the spring guy breaks. Upgrading a sniper rifle, it's, it's kind of a pain in the ass. It is fun if you like tech working, if you like teching. Go for the route with the upgrade base, but if you just want a gun that works out of the box and you just want to play and smoke all those people on the field, go with a gun like this. When it comes to customizing, you can still customize this gun. Not as much as the VSA 10, but you still can get lots of parts. You can, you know, put a silence on it, you can exchange the other barrel to a different one, you can put on a different rail, different bolt handle. You can also get a different stock, so all the fun parts, so, you know, exchanging the external the part of the customizing which is fun and not a pain to deal with. You can still do those things with the sniper rifle. But when, when it comes to internals, of course, the Tokyo Marui Vista 10, for example, has just much more options out there. So now again, let's make a summary of the whole thing. First option was the cheap China-made sniper rifle. Just don't do it. If you like tech working and you have experience with teching, go with an upgrade base like a Vista 10 or an APS-2 system. And if you just want to go out there, play, smoke all those people and don't, you know, deal with any tech problems and if you just don't want to deal with all this hassle of upgrading a sniper rifle, go with the Norwich SSG24. Let's talk about camouflage. Camouflage is very important for the airsoft sniper, but most people kind of approach it from the wrong direction. I mean, when I look at people on the field, in a lot of cases I see players who have no face camo no rifle camo, but then they're wearing a super fancy gill suit. This makes no sense. First, do the basics. Every player makes different mistakes when it comes to camouflage, and the easiest way to find out what you're doing wrong is just play airsoft, and every time somebody spots you and shoots you, go ask the person how he spotted you. In most cases, you will hear movement, and you can't buy camouflage for movement, so you have to work on the way you move and where you move. And when it comes to camouflage, you can actually buy or change or adjust. Usually you hear things like your gun, your face, your head or your hands if you're not wearing gloves. Now those are all things you can fix very, very easily. Let's start with the gun. The easiest thing you can do here is wrapping the gun with camo tape or you just spray paint the entire gun. That's step one. If you want to go one step further, you can use a 3D ghillie wrap or you can also add some vegetation to the gun. But there be careful, don't do it too much because it will kind of limit the function of the gun and maybe you have branches in front of your scope and things like this. Let's head on to the face. There are also again very different ways to camouflage your face. The easiest one and the most practical one is a mesh mask which I recommend anyways because it's also safety. And additional to the mesh mask, you can use a scarf, for example, or you can also wrap your entire face with scarf. What you can also do is just paint your face, but then you don't have protection, so be careful with this. Safety is always first, but if you just if you just can't play with a face mask for whatever reason, at least paint your face with face camo. When it comes to camouflaging your head, the easiest and most convenient way is using a boonie. A boonie breaks the silhouette of your head very nice with the shield around it. And additional to that, you can also add some vegetation into the small loops that boonies usually have. Now those are the basics and once you mastered all the basics, you can go at once. There I recommend using a 3D gilly. I designed one myself, I think it works the best for of snipers because it's separated and it doesn't limit your view. But there's much other alternatives out there which are also great. And if you want to go even one step further, you can go with uh, the ghillie suit, you know, from real snipers. But there you always have to keep in mind that those ghillie suits are designed for people who are lying at the same spot for several hours. So it's not really designed for airsoft. I 
I don't recommend it to anybody, but you can still try. Maybe you're this type of sniper who just likes to lie around for hours, then definitely try a proper ghillie suit. Again, a quick summary. First, do the basics. Maybe, you know, you can take a picture of yourself in a forest and you can kind of figure out what you're doing wrong. Maybe you're wearing colorful shoes and stuff like this. Then when you get shot, ask the guy who shot you what he did wrong. Work on your movement. That's probably the most important thing. Work on your movement and always, you know, look at the area where you move. You should move in the shade and things like this. And once you master all this, you can go advanced. But then I think as an asset type, it's not really necessary to have these additional camouflage systems. But you can try it, maybe you're the type for it. Let's talk about accessories for your sniper rifle. Let's start with the most important accessory by far, which is the optic. The optic is very important so you can make those accurate shots. Maybe, you know, you see an enemy, maybe just an elbow. You need a good optic that you can get the BB exactly on the spot where you want it to go. Now there we have different options. We have the red dot, which looks like this. There are many different options out there. But in general, I wouldn't recommend red dots for sniper rifles. They're just not as accurate. It's only a dot and you don't have the, the very thin crosshairs. It's more for assault rifles, for close quarter combat. It's very useful because then you can keep both of your eyes open. But for the sniper rifle, you look for something a little more accurate. Also, you want something that gives you a little zoom so you can get that crosshairs exactly on the spot where you want it to be. So let's talk about the traditional optic systems, the scopes. We have three types of them right here. Here we have a very, a very modern one with the turret adjusters. Those are really nice because you can adjust them with your gloves. You don't need tools, so that's a big plus right there. Then we have illuminated crosshairs, which are useful but not a must. On my sniper rifle I don't use an illuminated crosshair and I don't think you really need it unless you want to play at night games, but then night games with bolt action sniper rifles, not the smartest idea. I don't recommend it. Again, we have different models here. This one has lots of functions. Also, it has a variable zoom, which is... This one is just perfect, actually. It's from one time zoom to four times. That's what you're looking for. You don't need those nine times zooms. It's really not needed, even... When I was at the military, we had a four times zoom scope and we shot at targets which were around one kilometer away. So in airsoft, you will never shoot at anything um, which is further away than 100 meters. So everything above four times zoom, you don't need it. Here we have a very simple scope. Those are the scopes that I prefer because they are very, very lightweight. It's about half the weight of this scope here. And even if those are cheap, this one is, for example, $20. That's the one I'm using for eight years now. It's made by Swiss Arms, or at least uh, the brand is Swiss Arms. And it's very simple. It has a fixed zoom. It's a four times zoom. And you have here the two, the two adjustments. Right here, you lose this cap, and here you can adjust it. Left, right, top, and down. And as I said, lightweight, cheap, very reliable, and due to the fixed zoom, you kind of learn to measure the distance with your scope, because you know if your target looks this big in your scope, you kind of know how far it is away. That's a problem with the variable magnification ones. You Usually you tend to play around with them, and then you kind of lose track of how far your enemy is away, because you always change your zoom. Now, if you like to make videos just like I do it, you will come across this scope cam setups. Now, this is not the most convenient setup. It's a big camcorder on top of the very minimal scope. It's basically the same scope, just upside down to so have more space for the camcorder. There are lots of other options out there. I don't recommend this for a beginner. It's a very advanced setup. Um, it's heavy and it needs a lot of love to get it to work, so I would rather go with a very simple Mobius cam or a run cam from brainexplodercreations.com there you can get all those setups I highly recommend those even though if you want the best quality you will have to go with the camcorder it's still the best quality option out there but again not convenient at all those are a real pain to work with okay so so much for the scopes um, again real quick 
They're the fancy ones with the turn adjustments, illuminated crosshairs, variable zooms. In my opinion, you don't need all this. I like the very lightweight minimal versions with the fixed zoom. I personally run a 4x zoom magnification times 40 millimeter. That's the diameter of the optic in front. And it works just perfect. If your optic gets too big, just like this one, that here has a diameter of 60 millimeter, I think. Nice because you get a lot of light into it and you might be able to spot your enemy easier, but the enemy will be also more likely to spot you because a huge circle like this will give you your position away in lots of cases. That's, by the way, also the case with this setup. Two perfect circles at this size, same size, and they're above each other, it's perfectly aligned. That looks so unnatural, you will get spotted with these things all the time. But again, if you want the best quality, there's no way around the camcorder. Okay, so much to the scopes. Uh, real quick to the scope mounts. Always try to go as low as possible, but you still should be able to aim. The reason why you want to be as low as possible is because you want to be in line of your bore as much as possible. If your scope is up here, for example, and you aim at a target at 10 meters, you see the, the side of your scope and the trajectory of the BB, it will not be the same and you will miss your shot. Also, the higher your scope is, the easier you will get spotted because you want to be as low profile as possible. So, I'm running the lowest mounts possible and I just adapted my mesh mask as, as slick to my face as possible. So this way I'm still able to aim with my scope, even with the lowest mounts and the mesh mask on. Okay, so much about the scope, so let's go to the next in my opinion, the second most important accessory, which is the sling. Here, I use a very simple sling. I built it myself. It's basically a belt from a hardware store. And the reason why I went with this one is because most, most slings that are out there on the market, they are, they are super fancy, they have a million of buckles and they are quick adjustment, fast release, super tactical. In my opinion, that's all bullshit. You want a sling that's as simple as possible, it should be wide so it's comfortable and you really don't need all those functions, you don't need a sling which is you know that you can you can convert it from 1.2, 2 2.2, 3. you don't need all of this stuff. If you want to know more about slings and how to use them you can check out my sniper guide series there I explain different types of slings in more detail and how to use them, which positions, the position in front and the back, how to make the transitions and all this kind of stuff but real quick, in my opinion, two-point slings are the best for sniper rifles because you make transitions to your secondary and they provide the most stability for your gun. But also, you can still make very quick transitions. Okay, in order to mount your sling, obviously you need sling mounts. Here, those are the sling mounts of the SSG24. You can mount them both here and here in the back. Here on the stock of the M40A3 from the SG24, we have the sling mounts on the sides. It's QD sling mounts, you can just click them in. Those are more practical in my opinion, also because they are on the sides. Here on the SG24, the gun will hang kind of unnaturally because it will flip, which is not super practical. There I really prefer the stock of the M40A3 because the sling mounts are on the side and the gun will hang sideways very naturally. Alright, let's talk about the accessories where I think they are not really important and they are more for optic purposes. So, if you want to look cool, you can definitely have a look at those accessories, but again, I don't think they are very useful. One of those accessories is, for example, the silencer. The problem with silencers on sniper rifles is that for spring pod bolt action sniper rifles, which are the best ones in my opinion, the sound basically comes maybe 90% from the cylinder, so from the impact of the piston on the cylinder head. Adding a silencer on the end doesn't really do anything, so it doesn't make any sense. Again, it looks cool, but once you use one, you will figure your gun gets longer, your gun gets heavier, but you don't get anything in return except looking cool. So again, I don't recommend it. There we have another type of silencer. It's actually not a silencer, it's a tracer unit. For those of you who have never seen one of those, it's for glow-in-the-dark BBs. There are special BBs and once they get exposed to light, they light by themselves and you can use them for night games. 
because you can track your BBs and you can see where you're shooting. Not very useful for bolt action sniper rifles in my opinion because playing at night with a gun like this it makes no sense. If you do it you will you will know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Another kind of useless accessory in my opinion but a nice looking one is the bipod we're having right here. In my opinion bipods are useless because the sport airsoft is a very dynamic and a very fast sport and you don't have time to set up your rifle with your bipod, adjust the height of your bipod. You don't have time for this. And additional to that it's adding weight to your gun, useless weight, you want to keep, keep your gun as light as possible. And then it gets tangled up with your sling and stuff so I don't really see a point. Anyways if you want to go with a bipod make sure it's a bipod which you can adjust very very easily just like this one. The other ones out there with buttons and stuff but those are usually not the best ones. Those spring charged ones are the most handy ones in my opinion because you can set them up really really quickly. Also the here the extension of the little arms right there it's also spring powered just like this. Uh, what's also important on a bipod is that you can adjust it with adjustment I mean the level of the gun right here I have a tiny adjuster and because the airsoft environment is not always completely flat so you want to have a bipod where you can do the following you can tie kind of tilt your gun it's very important because airsoft guns use hop-up system and your gun always have to be perfectly leveled so always look for a bipod where you can do that so that's already one of the most useful bipods, it's called Harry Style Bipod and it's a great bipod, but then I think they're useless. Even at the military we shot at distances of one kilometer, as I already mentioned. Even there we didn't use a bipod, so why would you use it in airsoft then? So much about the main accessories, again scope, bipod, slings, silencers are the most common ones. Another accessory is the stock. Why do I call it accessory? I call it accessory because you can also exchange it. Here in the SSG24 you can exchange the M24 style stock to an M40 A3 style stock. Why would you do that? Okay, first it looks different, looks cool and also this stock has a lot more features. For example, you can adjust the height of your cheek rest. Why would you do that? Um, very basically with the cheek rest you can adjust the height of your stock so you just lean into the gun and you will always be in line with your scope that's not really possible with the M24 stock but with the M40 A3 stock because again you can adjust it right here also on the stock you have the sling mounts on the side so the gun will hang on naturally also you have a almost 90 degree grip right here which gives a little more comfort than this one in my opinion and also here you can add a rail. This stock has, it has some really cool features. Yeah, so much about accessories. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Links to some of the products will be below this video. And yeah, see you guys in the next guide. In this video I'm going to tell you how you can adjust the length of the stock of your sniper rifle and why it is important. Now, the most important thing about the length of your stock is that it can ease the bolt pull of your spring-powered bolt-action sniper rifle. Let's say you have very short arms and the stock is adjusted all the way to the back. You might not be able to, to grab it because it's too far away or it will, be, it will just not feel smooth at all, right? And if you have very sh long arms, if you have very long arms and the stock is all the way adjusted in, so as short as possible, it kind of looks like this and you will get a very awkward angle on your elbow and you might not be able to apply the force onto the bolt to be able to compress the spring. So what you want to do is you want to find the perfect length for your body. I recommend just trying different settings, you know, um, just extend the thing all the way back put it all the way in and try what works best for you, reload it several times and the spot where it's the easiest for you, that's where you should keep the adjustment. Now for a general rule of thumb, um, usually that's how it is. You put the, the butt pad of your snap rifle onto the inside crook of your elbow and then the middle knuckle of your index finger should be on a 90 degree angle right here. 
then the setting is all right. So adjust, adjust it to this setting. But again, try different settings and whatever works best for you, keep it there. Every sniper rifle has a different system to adjust the length of your stock. Some stocks don't even have the possibility to change the length, like on my VFZ10 where it's a fixed stock M700 style. But here on the SSG24, you can easily adjust the stock with this adjustment wheel. First, you untie this little skinny disc here, and then with the big wheel, you can adjust the length just by twisting it. Then there are other alternatives out there where you have plates, you can just add plates to the stock and remove plates to the stock. And yeah, that's how you adjust the stock of your sniper rifle to your arms. Let's talk about triggers. Basically, there are two triggers on the market. First, we have the one-stage trigger and also the two-stage trigger. What's the difference? It's very easy. The one-stage trigger, you basically just have one resistance, you pull through it and the shot will break and the gun will shoot. On the two-stage trigger, you have two different stages, where first you pull, it's very easy and very lightweight, as you can see. But on the very end, you have this wall, where you have to break through, and then the shot breaks. When you look at real steel firearms, you usually have a one-stage trigger for speed shooting. So, IPSC, maybe competition shooting, things like this. So it doesn't really fit the role of precision shooting. Mm. The problem is that maybe you're in a very stressful environment, you're shaky, you know, there are BBs flying above your head, and you get the target in your crosshairs, you want to feel your trigger, but you already, you know, you pull a little too hard and the shot already breaks, and you probably miss your target. Now on the two-stage trigger, it works like this. You see your enemy, you go with your finger to your trigger, you feel the trigger, you pull it back, and the shot doesn't immediately break. You pull it back and let me just demonstrate this. You pull it back here in the beginning it's very easy, then you hit the wall and then you know okay once I pull through this wall the shot will break. So you can time your shot better. Let's say there's an enemy moving and you want to shoot him while moving, their timing is really crucial. So you touch your trigger, pull all the way back to the second stage and when you know, okay, I have to shoot exactly now, you pull through the second stage. And yeah, quick summary, one stage triggers are usually for speed shooting. Unfortunately, they also use it for precision rifles and airsoft. Two stage triggers are more for precision rifles. Also, the gun had the military, it was called SSG-69. Also, this gun had a two stage trigger because again, it gives you just a little more control. And yeah, so much about the triggers. Both triggers are adjustable. Here in the Vista 10, we have two adjustment screws for the trigger. In front is trigger pull, and here in the back we have trigger travel. The trigger travel one just works perfectly, and it's a really nice feature of Marui. But the trigger pull one doesn't really work because the resistance while pulling the trigger of the actual spring and the trigger system is way harder than the one on the adjustment screw together with the adjustment spring. So this doesn't really work. Only the trigger travel works, but not the trigger pull. It's kind of a marketing. Lots of manufacturers do this, but um, the, the trigger pull screws, mm, they never really work for adjustment. Here in SG24, we only have one adjustment screw. It's also for trigger travel. This one also works just perfectly, like in the Marui. You can adjust it with an Allen key. And you can basically set the way of the first stage until you hit the second stage. There is no perfect way to adjust your trigger, it's a user preference thing. Some people like to have a really short and crisp trigger pull and some people like to have more control and have a little longer trigger pull. Just try whatever works best for you and then stick to it. Don't change it too often because if you always change it you won't really get a feeling for your gun and that's not a good thing, definitely not. That's my two cents about triggers, hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys in the next guide. In this video I'm going to teach you how you can maintain your bolt action sniper rifle. To be more specific, spring powered bolt action sniper rifles. First of all you want to keep the precision part of your gun completely clean. I'm talking about the inner barrel, the hopper bucking, hop up chamber and also the magazine. Now why the magazine? Obviously your magazine has to be clean otherwise your BBs will get dirty and once you have dirty BBs inside your gun it will not shoot accurate anymore. Now the different theories out there, which way is the best to clean your barrel. Lots of people use silicone spray. 
Uh, they apply the silicone spray on cloths and then shove it down the barrel. I don't recommend this at all. Silicone spray, it's a lubricant, it's not a dissolvent, it's not used for cleaning, it's not made for cleaning. So what I recommend is cleaning alcohol, also called rubbing alcohol. You can get this at every pharmacy, it's maybe around 10 bucks and it lasts for about a year I would say. So that's the way to go in my opinion. How often should you clean your inner barrel? I would say before every game. I I do it before every game and it works just perfect. Some people also do it during the game, on lunch break for example. I think that's kind of an overkill. If you do it one time before the game, that should be enough. Okay, so how do you clean the barrel and how do you keep all your hopper bucking clean? You take some kind of tissue. You just have a, a regular tissue. As you can buy it in every supermarket, those work just perfect. You can also use toilet paper or stuff like this or microfiber cloth if you want to go all in. Cut it into a small piece like this and then you shove it through the hole of the barrel cleaning rod. I like to fold mine in half so I can get it better through the hole and then you're good to go. After that you open your rubbing alcohol bottle and you dip it right in there, get it wet and then it's usually it contains a little too much rubbing alcohol so I like to wipe it off a little on the tissue again and then you're good to go. Before you shove your cleaning rod all the way down your barrel make sure that your hop up is turned all the way off otherwise you will jam the barrel cleaning rod into the hopper bucking and you might disturb the position of the hopper bucking or you might break it so make sure that it's all the way off so minimum hop up. Then you take a cleaning rod with your with your tissue right here, you twist it a little around and you just go in and twist it. Now here make sure that it's not too much resistance. Um, yeah, just like this. It should feel smooth and light. There shouldn't be too much friction. If there's too much friction, you use too much cloth or too thick cloth and that, that's not a good thing. It should be light and smooth. You basically just want to wipe the inner surface of your inner barrel. You don't want to polish it or something. Okay, go all the way in. Um, what's very useful here is if you bring the bolt back because then you have more space to work with a barrel cleaning rod. Um, by the way, before you're doing all of this, check the safety of your gun. Before I started this video, I checked that there's no BB inside the gun. That's why I also don't have safety glasses on. So always check the safety, have your gun on safe, make sure there's no BB inside the gun before you do any maintenance on your sniper rifle. Okay, so the bolt is all the way back. Now I can, here you can see that I can go all the way in here to into the hop-up chamber. And as you can see already, the cloth is completely black. We will have to do this with a new cloth again until it's completely clean. Also while pulling the rod out of the barrel, keep twisting it so you get all the dirt. And So as you can see here, the tissue is completely dirty. Um, so we have to repeat this process until until the tissue comes out clean of the barrel. So we cut another one, repeat this process. And meanwhile, let me tell you why I like cleaning alcohol over the other solutions people use. What's nice about cleaning alcohol is that it evaporates. Um, you know, if you use water, for example, which is, by the way, I think, the second best alternative. Way better than silicone spray already, but water doesn't dissolve, but cleaning alcohol does. After you finish with cleaning, your barrel will be completely dry and completely free from all kinds of dirt, oil and stuff. Because it's a dissolvent, and that's exactly what we want to achieve. That's why I think cleaning alcohol is the best solution. Okay, let's see how it turns out this time. Already way more clean. That's, that's already pretty good. Let's turn it all the way around. Twist it around the barrel cleaning rod the other way. And twist the cleaning rod the other way into the barrel. Try it again. And then we should be pretty much done. Alright, here we go. It's a clean, clean tissue right there. As you saw, it only took three complete strokes and the barrel is clean. 
Now, as mentioned before, you also want to keep your magazine clean. What I recommend is always use closed pouches when you're on the field so those magazines don't get dirty. Anyhow, if they get dirty, you can just, you know, put them into a water bucket, into a bucket full of water and move it around in there and it, the magazine should get clean by this. If it's really, really dirty, you can also disassemble the magazine. I don't recommend this to anybody because those magazines are really, really tricky to assemble again because of the spring inside and the follower. You can do it anyways, but don't be disappointed if you can't get it assembled. Okay, so so much about the precision part of, you know, keep the barrel clean, keep the upper bucket clean, very important. Do it before every game, just follow the steps that I just showed you. And then you should have an accurate gun. Okay, in the next video I will talk about keeping the power part of your gun working reliable and looped up. So, stay tuned for the next guide. In this video guide I'm going to show you how you keep the power part of your gun maintained, so how you keep it looped up, how you clean everything and how you keep it reliable. Okay, before we starting to disassemble the gun, always make sure that there's no BB inside the gun. Remove the magazine, already remove this and already check there's no BB chambered. Let the piston go. Put the gun back to safe and then you're ready to disassemble the gun. Here we have the SG24, um, very easy to disassemble. Most sniper rifles, especially the M700 style sniper rifles, are very, very easy to disassemble, just like this one. Anyhow, this one is a little different because it has one more mounting screw. I will show you this real quick. On the SG24, the outer barrel is also fixed into the stock of the gun, which makes it a little more sturdy uh, because the Auto barrel has no wobble anymore, so that's a nice feature. And you remove it, just turn this counterclockwise and remove this. It's actually the bipod mount, but it also acts as a screw. So just remove this one. Then we go on to the 3mm Allen key to remove those two screws on the trigger guard. And those are the three connection points from the stock to the receiver barrel assembly. Okay, once those screws are loosed, you can remove the stock from the receiver barrel assembly. And yeah, the next step is removing the magwell from the receiver barrel assembly. Now if you want to know more on how to disassemble this gun, you know, every single piece, every single bit, then there's a video linked below this video where I go through all steps. Once you have the magwell removed, on most sniper rifles you can now unscrew the auto barrel from the receiver. On the SG24, however, it's a little different because I wanted that there's no play between the receiver and auto barrel, so we have an additional little hidden screw which presses from the top onto the outer barrel and the screw is hidden below the front screw of the Picatinny rail so let's remove this one real quick below this one is a screw and therefore you need a 1.5 millimeter allen key it's right in there lose it and then we will be able to remove the outer barrel from the receiver just like that Just twist it counterclockwise and you will be able to separate those two. Now this is the precision part of the gun. Here we have the, the hard, the power part of the gun. Real quick, that's the trigger assembly right here. Cylinder, cylinder head and inside is the piston, spring guide and spring. Inside the cylinder is the piston and it moves really fast so you have to keep it lubricated also because it has to seal so a little lubrication is always a good thing. Now in order to remove this Cylinder head, there are two different ways. You can either go with a clamp like this, a wrench basically, here on the outside. You can just, you know, grab it like this. And you can twist it. If you don't have a tool like this at home, don't worry. I took care of this. You can just use pliers and insert it into those two holes to remove the cylinder head. Okay, all right. In here we can already see the piston with the seal cap right there. 
the glide ring here in the back. Then we have the spring. This is an M180. And then we also have a spring guide inside, which we just leave inside the gun for the maintenance. So this is a very new gun. It's not dirty so far, but usually the piston will be very, very dirty. So you can just clean it with a, with a tissue, you know, make everything clean and nice. Also for the spring. And if you want, you can also get the, the spring guide out of the system by pulling back the cylinder and then the spring guide will fall out. And you can just, you know, clean it again with the tissues. Once you cleaned all of this stuff, you need oil to lubricate it again because you don't want the system to be dry. For the rubber parts, for the glide parts, we want to use silicone oil. Now this is the silicone oil that comes with the Airsoft Innovation Tornado Grenade or the Cyclone Grenade. But any silicone oil you can get at the hardware store will work. Don't apply the oil onto the piston directly because if you put it on here and then you shove it into the cylinder, all the excess of the oil will just be on the outside here, this makes no sense. So just put some oil into the cylinder like this while turning the cylinder and then you're good to go. For the parts like the spring guide and the piston, this is metal friction against metal. There you don't want to use silicone oil because silicone oil is more for, for rubber and stuff like this. So here you want to use some metal oil. Now for those parts I like to use an oil like this which is just inside this can. It's a spray oil. And you can get it at any hardware store, just ask for a WD-40 and everybody, everybody will know what you're talking about. So just to take the parts, put them onto some tissue and apply the oil. Here less is more, don't overdo it. You don't want too much oil on all those parts. And once you spray them, take the tissue and wipe it with the with the oil soaked tissue because if you do it like this you remove the, the excess and if you put too much oil you can just wipe it off again same for the spring just glide it one time through the oil soaked tissue and you're good to go put the spring back on always the narrow coils are in the back on the spring guide basically then you put the piston on it and you put it back into the cylinder. Now, before, as you saw, I already put the, the silicone oil into the cylinder. And now by pushing in the glide ring, it will equally spread throughout the entire cylinder. Just push it inside there and you're good to go. Another nice thing you can do, since you already have the... The tissue with the oil on it, you can also clean the cylinder a little bit on the outside. Maybe you can, you know, pull it back, also clean it here a little bit. Because those are also parts of friction, so it's nice to have a little bit of oil on it. You can also remove the entire cylinder, but therefore you have to remove the trigger box from the receiver assembly. I don't recommend this at all, because those screws, they are secured with screw glue. And once you lose them, they are just not as tight in there anymore and maybe through the vibration of the shots the trigger box will come loose and fall off the receiver so never ever disassemble this trigger box this trigger box needs no maintenance you don't have to lube it or anything like this just keep it on there it will work forever don't worry about this part okay so put all the parts inside here for the for the cylinder head it has also the O-ring and O-rings need some silicone oil. So I apply some silicone oil right there. And then again, spread it with, with a tissue. And you should be good. Press the cylinder head onto the piston and just turn it into the system. Once, it, once the thread grips, just tie it again with pliers or the wrench as I just showed. Okay, turn it all the way in until you can feel a hard resistance. And then you're good to go. To spread the entire oil inside the cylinder, just pull, pull the cylinder back. Let it glide a few times back and forth. What I then recommend is to shoot into the tissue. 
not shoot, basically uh, let the air escape into the tissue because the oil excess will then shoot into the tissue and you rather want to have it inside the tissue than to have it inside your barrel because then you have to clean the barrel over and over again. So do this a few times and then you're pretty much set when it comes to the power part. The process I just showed you, don't do it too often. If you disassemble your gun too often, you will destroy the threads of the gun. Not as G24 already comes with steel screws and stuff, so it won't break as easy, but if you use a Marui gun, for example, or a cheap China-made gun, those threads will break pretty, pretty, pretty soon. So don't overdo the maintenance. I do what I just done maybe every 10,000 shots or something like this. So for the average as of player, you do this once a year. Again, don't do it too often. You will just do more harm than good. Okay, that's it. So much about the maintenance of the internals. When it comes to externals, you don't really have to do any maintenance. Just, you know, keep the gun clean. If there's dirt on it, use some cloth, some old t-shirt maybe with some water. And just rub the surface. But there's not really much you can do wrong. Just don't use any dissolvents which are based on oil. Because it may... It may dissolve the, the plastic in some way so you know just water and you're good to go. So much about the maintenance if you have any questions referring to disassembly of a sniper rifle and in specific the SG24 there's a video on the Novich Academy where I disassemble the entire gun every single screw every single part so maybe you can check out this video and learn a little bit about this. In this video I'm going to show you how you can exchange the spring of your SSG24. Now inside this gun is an M150 and I will exchange it to an M170. For this job we need the following tools. We need a set of Allen keys, we need nodal knees pliers, a small Phillips screwdriver and a big Phillips screwdriver. Before starting to disassemble your gun make sure that there are no BBs inside, make sure that the magazine is removed and that the safety is on and the gun isn't cocked. That's the most important thing, don't forget about this. Okay, let's get started by separating the rifle from the stock. Here, very easy. We have the three main screws. We can lose them with a 3mm Allen key. Let's get started with the middle one right here. If it's a little tough, use the long end of the Allen key. Here we go. Then we lose the screw behind the trigger guard and after that one we still have the front screw which is basically the bipod stud. Okay, now we go to the bipod stud, here just insert the allen key and turn it counterclockwise. And that's how you separate the stock from the receiver barrel assembly. Always make sure that you work on a clean table so you don't lose any screws and any of the parts. Now in order to separate the receiver from the auto barrel we have to remove the magwell right here. Therefore we use the Phillips screwdriver. One screw here in the back, one screw here in the front and then we can already remove this part. Again make sure that you don't lose any of those tiny screws. Put it aside and now we still can't separate the order barrel from the receiver because there's one hidden screw here on top below the front screw of the Picatinny rail. So first we have to remove this screw right here. Again with an Allen key. I think that's the 2mm one. Yes, 2mm one. So remove this one. Take out this screw. And below the screw sits a very tiny thread screw. Therefore we need a 1.5mm Allen key. So we can lose this one. Just twist it a few times. Three or four times should be enough. You don't have to completely unscrew it. Again, just do it a few turns. And now we can separate those two parts. Just turning the outer barrel counterclockwise a few times and we're set. In here sits the glide ring, it can fall out. Okay, this one here stays inside. If it falls out, just put it back on again. In order to remove the cylinder head, you can either use a wrench 
or you can also use needle nose pliers. Just insert it into the easy access holes of the cylinder head, turn it counterclockwise and once you lose it you can also use your hands for this job. Okay, piston already comes out. Here inside we have the M150 and now we're going to exchange this spring to the M170 which is inside this package. Let's open this one. Get it off there. You don't have to lubricate those springs because they're coated and they will not they will not oxidize so you don't have to worry about that. Just put it inside there. If you're doing the spring change after already owning the SSG24 for a long time, you might want to lubricate the piston a little bit and the cylinder with some silicone oil. But if it's, you know, just a few months old, you're good to go. It sh should be it should be still lubricated. Now we have to screw back on the cylinder head. Just center it right here. Push it inside and then screw it on. Here you need a little force, but it's nothing that's difficult. Just do it like I just showed it. Then we use the needle nose pliers. Again, use the easy access holes right here. And put it back in. Make sure to tighten it. Don't let it loose. Okay, so this should already work. Let's make a compression test. Therefore, just pull back and test if the piston stops right here in the system. Safety is on. It's a perfect seal right there. That's how it should be. I know that some people like to remove the trigger box so they can pull out the cylinder to change the spring. It's not necessary and I also don't recommend it at all because those screws here, they are secured with screw glue and once you break the screw glue, it's just not as tight on there anymore and the screws might come loose from the vibration of the harder springs. So always keep this trigger box on there. There's no reason why you have to remove this trigger box. It also needs no maintenance so you don't have to disassemble it. And you will also lose warranty if you disassemble the trigger box, so just don't do it. Okay, now we can reassemble the whole thing again. Take the outer barrel, screw it on there. And you basically just do the same steps that I just showed you for this assembly, but you do it in reverse. Okay, make sure that those holes are aligned right here. And then first you put on the magwell right here the part with the the part with the hole is in front so those two holes are above each other and here you also have to make sure that this hole here of the outer barrel has to be aligned with the hole in the middle because otherwise you can't tighten that screw okay let's put the magwell back on also make sure that this screw right here that this is aligned just like this one six minutes and now we can put the magwell back on here with this hole in front. So those two holes are also aligned. And you're set. Put it back in and then you basically have the, the receiver and barrel assembly already back together. So you can put it back into the stock. So as you can see it's not magic to adjust those springs. It's very easy. Everybody can do it. Now before we put the complete assembly back into the stock, we tie the screw here on top again. The screw is used that, that there's no wobble whatsoever on the auto barrel. It's an additional little feature of the SG24 which I really like because as you can see there is no wobble at all. And then we put back in this tiny screw right here. Just put it in there with your Allen key. Tighten it again. And you're set. The tech part of the gun is already finished. Now we just have to put it back into the stock. It's easy like that. Just put it in there. And then you can already tighten the screws again. Insert all three screws and the front one here. The bipod attachment stud. Then you can use the 3mm Allen key again, put it through there, 
and tight it. Don't overdo this, don't over tighten the screw. Just as soon as you can feel a little resistance, stop tighten it. Then here we do the middle steel screw, right on the trigger guard, and here behind the trigger guard. And then you're all set. Again, it's no magic, everybody can do it. Let's test it again. Okay, safety is off. As you can see, that's the ball pull of an M170. Works just perfect. Now to demonstrate real quick how smooth the action still is, even with the M170, here I just use my pinky and I can still pull it back with ease. Return it. Smooth, lightweight, just the way it should be. So that's how I exchange the spring. Everybody can do it, so don't be afraid to do it. In this video, I'm going to talk about BBs, their quality, what's important and what you have to take care of. Now, why do I have an entire video just on BBs? I'm doing this because BBs are the most crucial factor when it comes to the accuracy of your gun. You can upgrade your gun as much as you want. You can, you know, drop in thousands of dollars of tuning parts. As long as you don't use quality BBs, all of this makes no sense. So BBs are actually the cheapest way to improve your accuracy because, you know, those bags of BBs, they're just a few bucks. And as an airsoft sniper, you don't need a lot of them. So don't save money on BBs. Try to get the right BB, try to get the right weight and the right quality. And in this video, I'm going to show you how you test the quality of a BB and which weight is the best for you. So starting with the weight, there is a list below this video where I show you for which FPS you should use which weight. Again, that's my preference, but you can, you know, try those weights and see how it works for you and stick to the ones you like the best. But a general rule of thumb is that always go a little higher with your weight. Most people use two lightweight BBs in their guns. I'm doing guys of sniping now for eight years already and I went through all these brands and all kind of different BB weights, BB colors and BB brands. Here I made this construction to show you the difference between those BBs, why are they bad or why they are good. Um, as you can see, it's, should, it's supposed to make close-ups from the BBs. No idea if this works, but we'll figure it out. Let's start with the first brand that I used. It's called Biowell. They make those biogradable white BBs, which in my opinion, they are really great to have a nice surface. They are of good quality. But the problem is that the heaviest they offer is 0.3 gram, which is in most cases a little too lightweight unless you have an FPS limit like, you know, 300 FPS or something like this. So let's have a look at the BB. Let's put it here onto our fancy camera setup. So here you can see the close-up of the Bible BBs. As you can see, they are flawless. They are super perfectly polished. They are perfectly white. Those are great BBs and they also claim that they're biogradable. Now, I wouldn't say that that's true necessarily. A lot of brands claim that the BBs are bio biogradable, but then actually they're not. So no idea if, if this is true, but I used those, I used the Bible BBs for almost, I think, three years and I was really happy with them. But once I used heavier BBs in my 550 FPS sniper rifle, I figured those are way too lightweight. So the next brand that I used is called Bioshot. No idea where they're made. They claim that they're made in the US. I, I don't think that they're made in the US. I think they're made somewhere in Asia. But whatever. I don't really care where they're made, but I care about the quality. Let's have a look at those BBs and see how those are. Um, now they're already 0.4 grams, so they're 0.4 grams and they are white, so that's already a nice combination. But when it comes to the quality, let me show you real quick why those are not the perfect BBs. So here we have three examples of the Bioshot. As you can see, the two ones here, they are pretty much flawless. The surface is not perfectly polished. Actually, this one is also not flawless. We have a, a small crater over here. Um, it's hard to show you guys. Here we go. So here we have a small crater, here we have a big crater, and those BBs are kind of inconsistent when it comes to the surface. But they are white and they are heavy, so they already have a nice trajectory. Anyways, they're still not perfect due to a lack of quality control. As you can see here, we have this little hole in the BB. And if your hop-up grips exactly at this hole, it will 
not go where you want it to go. After I used the Bioshot BBs for probably one year, I still wasn't happy. I mean, you can see them in your scope because they're white and they're heavy. So they already provide a way better trajectory than the Biowell BBs, even if those are of better quality, but the weight just is more important in this case because I'm playing with 550 FPS and 0.3 gram BBs are just way too lightweight. After this, I was looking for something that's as heavy as the 0.4 grams from Bioshot and that also provides the quality of the Bioshot BBs. Then I came across the GNG BBs. Those are 0.33 grams. They're not as heavy as the 0.4 grams, but they are somewhere in between. Uh, let's have a look at those BBs. Let's put those BBs under the close-up camera. Okay, all right. So this is the close-up of the GNG 0.33 gram BBs. As you can see, the, the surface is flawless. You can also see the light, how it reflects on the BBs because they're so nicely polished. But then the problem with those BBs is that they are not perfectly white. So you can't track them in your scope. You can't correct shots. And as an asset sniper, you always want to see your BB because, you know, there's wind, there's other influences. Like, well, it's mostly wind, actually, wind and gravity. And you want to correct for your shots. And with the gray BBs, you just don't see them. You can't correct. So after using those BBs, I figured I will never ever use any other BBs than white BBs. It's just a pain to deal with anything that's not perfectly white. So after already one game, I stopped using the, the GNG 0.33 gram BBs. After using the 0.33 grams from GNG, I tried the Vulcan 0.36 gram BBs. Now those BBs from the quality, they really remind me of the, of the Bioshot ones. They are white, they are heavy. But again, we have the same problem. As you can see here is one example. Let's put three more BBs. So here on the close-up camera, we have the Welcome 0.36 gram BBs. As already mentioned, they remind me of the Bioshot BBs because some of the BBs are just pretty much perfect. I mean, the surface is kind of rough. They're not very nice polish, but it's still equal, so that's good. But here we have another example of bad quality control. As you can see here, we have those small cuts in the BB and it looks kind of damaged. And again, if your hop-up grips at exactly those spots, it will need not it will not have the same result as if the hop-up grips on this BB right here. So your shots will be not consistent and not on point all the time because of the lack of quality control. Okay, after using the 0.36 grams from Vulcan. I think I used them also only for two games because they gave me pretty much the same results as the Bioshots. Now the Bioshots were a little better because they're heavier, but quality wise, those BBs are just not perfect. Um, so with those two brands, I had not just accuracy problems, but also feeding problems. Also the FPS, um, they really varied from BB to BB because of the inconsistency. So the next brand I came across is called Pro Balls. Those are 0.45 gram BBs. So from the weight, they are already pretty much perfect for the FPS that I'm using. But let's have a look at the quality of the Pro Ball BBs. Now those BBs, they claim that they are made, I think it's a British brand, but again, I doubt that they are made in Great Britain. Let's have a look. At those BBs. I can already see the color is nice. They are white. But oh oh my god. Look at this BB. I mean that's just <laughs> So the BB manufacturer claims that it's point uh, 9.95 with very tight tolerances. But just by looking at this BB, I mean look at those craters right there. That's really bad. Again, the Pro Balls, they also remind me of the, the Bioshot BBs and the Vulcan BBs. They are not perfectly white, uh, white enough. And some of the BBs are nice, but some of the BBs are just... Uh, yeah, Quality control is really bad right there. So after using the Pro Balls, I kind of figured that no matter which brand, I'm just not happy with the results. 
Um, they always try to make the bees as cheap as possible. And they're not wide, and wide enough, they are not, not heavy enough. Uh, there was just not, not the perfect brand out there. Because they just, again, they want to make them as cheap as possible. Mm, and they don't really understand that the Airsoft Sniper is willing to pay quite a lot of money for BBs because you're just shooting a few of them. And, uh, you know, unlike the Aichi, you have to use, you know, try to get cheap BBs because you're shooting so many of them. But the Airsoft Sniper, whatever it takes to get good quality BBs, people are willing to pay for them. So what I did is I contacted a BB manufacturer, one of the better ones out there. And I told them, make me the best sniper BBs possible. They have to be perfectly white, I want them to be polished, I want good quality control, and I want them to be heavyweight. And no matter what it costs, just charge me for it, I don't care, I want perfect BBs. And that's what the Norwich BB is. It is designed for snipers, I wouldn't use them for AEGs because they're really pricey. But then the quality control is just, it's just far away from... The brands like Bioshot and the, the Pro Balls and the Vulcan. Um, they're very similar to the, to the BioWell BBs when it comes to quality and similar to the GNG BBs. But then they are heavy and they are white. So let's have a look at those BBs, why they are just the way they should be. As you can see here on the close-up camera, there is no craters whatsoever. They are perfectly polished and they are heavy weight. So I'm using those PVs now for three months and I'm really happy with them. I use them in Russia for example and when you have a look at the Russian Milsim video you will see that the shots are really on point and then you can see them nicely in the camera. Let's compare the Novridge Sniper BBs to the Probal BBs so you can see the difference between good quality BBs and bad quality BBs. So here we have the Novridge BBs as you can see they are, they are really shiny, they are reflecting the light of this camera of the camera flashlight right here and the pro balls also do this but not in the same way because they're just not as nicely polished and when you look you know through the pro, pro, pro balls let's turn those around a little okay here we already have the, the faulty bb as you can see here there's a little crater and when you turn around the Norwich bbs you just won't find any of those problems um, now to get the bbs to this point again i'm paying I'm paying more money for the quality control and that's why the Norwich BBs also they're actually a lot more expensive than the normal sniper BBs but again as a sniper you don't use a lot of them and that's why I think they're totally worth it. Okay that's my two cents about BBs. Again BBs are very important don't save money on BBs it is the cheapest way to improve the accuracy and the range of your sniper and yeah let me know your experience with BBs in the comments below.